Welcome to the live portion of tonight's Foreign Affairs Live. Uh, I'm Jonathan Tepperman, uh, and I'll be playing the part of Gideon Rose through the rest of the evening, um, a much younger, better dressed version of Gideon Rose. <laughs> I'm the managing editor of Foreign Affairs magazine, or I should say I will be until Gideon hears about that last joke. Um, and I want to use the few minutes remaining to me in this office to kick the discussion off. Um, let me reintroduce our guests very briefly, um, and then we'll move on to the discussion. Um, just in case you were asleep for the last half an hour on my far left <laughs> is Shadi Hamid, who's uh, Director of Research at the Brookings Doha Center. Um, Shadi is also Vice Chair of the Project on Middle East Democracy and a correspondent for The Atlantic. Rob Malley, uh, at my immediate left, is Program Director uh, for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. And both men, I'm proud to say, are foreign affairs contributors. And you can find their work at foreignaffairs.com. We have about 35, 40 minutes for discussion. I'm going to kick things off by asking a few questions. And then I'm going to open things up to the floor. When I do, please wait for me to call on you, stand, and we'll have a microphone come to you. Identify your, your name and affiliation, please, um, and ask one um, short question. Um, one other housekeeping note, while we encourage tweeting at these events um, and have a live feed going, I believe we have to ask you to please silence your uh, electronic devices. So uh, gentlemen, uh, let's start. Um, by the way, we were having a great argument about Syria in the green room before we all came out here. We're going to get back there. I know Syria is the question on everybody's mind because it's the topic of the moment. But before um, I get to that, I want to ask a, a couple of more general questions. Um, let me start with what Gideon was saying. Is, is, is he right? Um, should we all relax? Will everything turn out OK? Will the Arabs, as Shadi said, uh, rise to the occasion? Shadi, why don't you start? Hmm. Well, this isn't, I don't think this is a time for us to step back. I mean, and as I suggested in my comments on, in the video, I think this could be, or perhaps could have been, the best opportunity for the US. And I don't think we've seized it. And I worry that the window of opportunity is closing. This being Syria or the spring? The, the, whole, the whole Arab Spring. Because if you look at a number of countries, with the exception of Tunisia, it's not looking very good. I mean, our closest ally, Egypt, essentially held several American citizens hostage. And they had to stay in the US embassy, because if they went out, they'd be arrested. And uh, Libya, the revolution worked the opposition was able to gain power, but now there are very serious challenges where certain groups want to have autonomy from the rest of the country, where different rebel uh, militant forces are fighting each other. So that, is, that, is the, that strengthens the argument for more international intervention, not less, because there is a chance that we'll go backward. There is a chance that autocrats could rise again. Um, so um, if anything, that's why I think that this is the time for the US to fundamentally reassess its foreign policy, and w along with our allies, because of course it can't be a unilateral sort of thing, but with Europe, with Turkey, with other emerging democracies, we have to find how we can help, how we can support these transitions. I mean, the Obama administration is committing between one to two billion dollars to Egypt. That's quite frankly embarrassing. That's a very small amount considering what Egypt has to face. So uh, you know, I know there's budgetary constraints here, but that's why I think there has to be bold leadership. And we need an administration to make the case to the American people that it's in our interest and it's in line with our ideals to do more. Rob, let me turn to you. First of all, do you have faith that the arc of history will bend towards justice and democracy in the Middle East on its own? And if not, what does the United States do? There's a tension here. Um, the, the Washington is under pressure on the one hand to do more. On the other hand, as we saw um, with Egypt in the NGO incident, uh, the, United States leverage the United States leverage is limited and perhaps more limited than it's ever been before. How should Washington strike that balance? Can it strike that balance? I think my weakest course in high school geometry, so I don't know much about arcs or, or <laughs> any geome geometric figures. Um, I think we have a tendency to go from one extreme to the other. There was one extreme that the Middle East, the Arab world would never get out of its uh, status quo, that it was forever going to be stuck in authoritarian regimes. And now, I don't want to take a, a shot at Gideon because he's not here, but you, you led well, the way. Means. But, but this, this notion that everything is going to turn out OK, they want everything that we want, they now have joined. I mean, they're not 
other and they're not like us. And I think we have to accept that. And by, they, by the way, I've Arab, I'm of Arab descent, so it's not a matter of us and they, but we can't expect that everything that we believe in is now what everyone else believes in the entire world, not just the Arab world. I think we have a tendency to, to jump from, from one to another. Listen, I think as, as, as uh, Shadi said, the picture right now is not one that would lend to great optimism. And if you're a cop living in Egypt, you probably don't think that what happened was particularly positive. If, if, if you rose up in Egypt because of the economic conditions, you probably may have some nostalgia for the ways of the past, and we should be realistic about that. If you're living in Syria, if you're living in, in Bahrain, it's not as if things have tended towards the, uh, uh, the very positive outcome that some, I think, rushed to judgment at the beginning and said everything's going to be fine and, and they're all moving towards democracy. That's, that's not where we are today. Now, you asked the question of what the U.S. should do. I agree with a lot of Shadi's analysis. I'm much more less uh, ambitious about what the U.S. can do. I don't think that this is, I think, as I think Secretary Albright said, this is not an American story. It impacts the U.S., but a, to a large extent, what these people were rising up against was not just depriva material deprivation and the lack of democracy. It also was the fact that they felt that their policies were being dictated from overseas, and in particular from the U.S. The sense of wanting dignity was also a sense of trying to change what had been decades of having the sense that Mubarak and others had subcontracted decision-making to the United States. But without a firm push from the outside, what happens? Does the Arab Spring let's, stop here? I, let's, mean, I mean, the Chinese and the Russians certainly would like it too. The Gulf monarchies would like it too. Shadi mentioned the case of the NGOs. I mean, what's remarkable, and maybe not remarkable, it shouldn't be surprising. Most Egyptians agreed with the SCAF, with the military authorities, and the way they treat not just American NGOs, but other NGOs as well. So it's not as if an American push is going to encounter this great wave of popular support. Again, there are things, mistakes we need to avoid, and there are things I, I, we could talk about more about what we should be doing. But the notion that we, by, because we're going to stand up for certain things in Egypt or elsewhere, that number one, it's going to restore our popularity. Number two, that people are going to listen to us. One of, one of the things about democracy is that the people in power, my last comment, the SCAF, the military in power in Egypt, might care what the White House says. It cares much more about what the Egyptian people feel because that's where their power may, right. depends on. Rob, but the reason that people don't like us and haven't liked us for such a long time is because we were supporting autocratic regimes for decades. Obviously, it's more complex than that. Israel-Palestine is central to that as well, but that was one of the major grievances. So if anything, I think there's something to be said for atonement, that we as Americans have to in some way atone for the sins of the past. I'll say something on leverage. Um, the, I think the Obama administration, and I'm having trouble understanding why, seems to have a problem with the concept of leverage. Leverage only works if people take your threat seriously. So when we threatened to withhold aid to Egypt, the military in Egypt did not take that threat seriously. And they were right, because now we're planning on resuming the aid, even though the fundamental issues <coughs> haven't been resolved. The Americans are still being charged. Um, there is a war being waged against Egyptian NGOs. Nothing has fundamentally changed, but we gave in. On, on Bahrain, there's a, I've heard that, uh, well, is the relocation of the Fifth Fleet on the table? Probably not, but let's say we did put it on the table. The Bahrainis wouldn't take us seriously on that because they know that we're not actually going to do that. The Syrians. They don't think we're actually going to consider military intervention. So we don't have, our threats aren't credible. Okay, so you're, you're criticizing the United States for not pushing hard enough, but isn't playing hardball precisely one of the reasons why the United States is so unpopular with governments and peoples in the region today? Well, I think there's a difference between good intervention and bad intervention. I don't think Arabs are against the principle of the U.S. being involved. And now, I think we should also remember, this is not the first Arab Spring. I know, you know, it was a long, you know, it was a long time ago and everything, but there was a first Arab Spring in 2005 under the Bush administration. And I was living in Jordan at the time, and there was a real sense of opportunity and optimism. Um, there is also an odd current of Bush nostalgia in the region. It was more so before the Arab Spring, but I remember in 2010, I would meet with Muslim Brotherhood leaders in Egypt or Jordan, and they'd say, wow, there was a real sense of opportunity under the Bush administration in that period of 2005. And Obama doesn't seem to take democracy promotion seriously. That was a real narrative 
that was present in the Middle East. Okay. Just, just quickly, one, one comment, because you know, again, in, in an ideal world, if we could be consistent everywhere, I'd be all in favor of it. But I think we have to recognize the fact it's not just Obama. It doesn't matter who was in the White House. If tomorrow there was a problem in Saudi Arabia, what, what do you think the U.S. will do? We may be mowing it. We know what they'll do. If there was a problem in Jordan, if there was an uprising in Jordan, who would we side with? If the Palestinians were to rise up in the West Bank against Israel, what would the U.S. do? So there is, I mean, and you know, we could say that the U.S. isn't showing enough leadership, but those are the realities I think we have to contend with. I think, and that's a real burden on the, Amer on the U.S.'s ability to play the role of moral leader. Du double standards happen all the time. I'm sure everyone in this room has been guilty of it at one point. I know I have. And it doesn't really matter because you always have double standards. Situations differ. But it does matter when you want to play the role that you would like the U.S. to play, which is that of sort of a moral leader. Then it's, it's fatal. You can't have a double standard when you claim to be the moral leader. And that's, that's something that, and I don't, I don't really fault the Obama administration for that, because if tomorrow it were to break ties or have a crisis with Saudi Arabia and with Jordan and with Bahrain and everyone else, then it would have a real problem in the region of the world where it already is, is losing allies quite quickly. So it's, it's dispiriting to some extent, but I think that's the, that's the world we live in. And if it is the world we live in, I think that notion that the U.S. can play the role of moral leader when it already is burdened by what happened in Iraq, which Arabs haven't forgotten, what happened in Guantanamo, mm. which Arabs haven't forgotten, what's happening to this day in the occupied territories where the Arabs won't forget. It's very difficult then to have the U.S. have the kind of image that you'd want it to have. Let me move the conversation one step further. It is argued, whether you agree with it or not, we can get into, that one way the United States could redress past mistakes is by getting involved in Syria. So let's talk about Syria. At the moment, the rebels seem to be on the run. They're getting routed in, in Homs and in Idlib. The Syrian government has finally started using its air force, a step that was dreaded. Uh, there were reports, although contested ones, that the, the, the Russians have landed um, uh, troops at their naval base in the country. And now, all of a sudden, there's fighting in Damascus, maybe real fighting for the first time. So the, the first question, a factual one, because you know the, the regions better than most of us. Absent outside intervention, what happens? Absent outside intervention, I think the opposition may very well be destroyed. Um, I don't think Assad is a dead man walking. I don't think that we can talk as if this is inevitable and we just have to wait because he's on his last legs. And we're seeing a shift in momentum in recent weeks where the, the, the regime is, is, uh, has, is been, has been having tactical victories and is pushing the rebels out of certain areas. So I think we have to accept the real possibility that if there isn't military intervention, then the Assad regime could very well stay in power and, and we could see more and more massacres on the scale of what we've seen in recent weeks where the, the death toll has sharply intensified. So with all this talk of diplomacy and Arab League mission and Kofi Annan, the death toll has only increased. So I think we have to face a choice and I think we have to give the Annan mission a last chance. He's got one week, two weeks. This is the final last ditch effort in my view. And I do agree that military intervention should only be used after all diplomatic options have been exhausted. If Anand can't come back with something, they have been exhausted. There is, in my view, nothing else we can do. It's been a year. Last March 15th is when the Syrian uprising began. We're talking about a year of trying everything. So when do we say enough is enough? And I should also just note that it, we have a very weird thing here where Arabs and Muslims are more enthusiastic about American intervention than Americans are. That's what we've come to. The Turks, the Tunisians, the Qataris, um, the French have all supported various forms of military intervention, buffer zones, humanitarian corridors, safe zones, no-fly zones. It's been discussed seriously in the region. But apparently it hasn't been discussed seriously in the U.S. So no one's talking about unilateral U.S. intervention. We're talking about a potential intervention that could have buy-in and would probably have buy-in from the Arab world and Turkey. Let me point you, before, uh, Rob, I let you jump in, to a new poll that's out today on how Americans feel about intervening in Syria. Uh, the, the, the numbers are uh, a rough majority actually favor the creation of safe havens if, and this is an important caveat, somebody else set, sets them up. That's 48%. Um, uh, 48% favor the use of U.S. air power to, to, to support, defend those safe havens that 
somebody else has set up. But a vast majority of Americans, three quarters, oppose the use of any ground forces. Rob, what do you think Obama should do? Well, can I first come back to, to, to where we are? And you asked the question yeah. where things will go if there's no intervention. First of all, with or without intervention, I think it, it depends what kind of intervention, but we may end up in a pretty dark place. And there's some intervention taking place already. I mean, Iran in, uh, is providing assistance to the, to the regime. And some Arab countries appear to be giving financial and some military assistance to the opposition. The question, of course, is what kind of intervention? Where this is likely to go at this point, short of either a diplomatic breakthrough or some major change of the military balance on the ground, is a protracted civil war in which the regime is still there but is not in control of the country. And the opposition is still there but not able to, to overthrow the regime. And it's a sort of a combination of Iraq and Lebanon, sectarian civil war that could go on for a very long time, of a regime that's in place and the, and the country beneath its feet is crumbling. I think that's a scenario that could have, take place even if there's military intervention. Now, what I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not allergic to all military interventions, although I think when it comes to the US and the Middle East, I'm allergic to most of them at this point. Um, I don't, can't think of many that have, that have ended successfully. But the problem I have with people who, all the ideas that, that Shadi mentioned, safe haven, uh, humanitarian corridor, uh, no-fly zone, for the most part, and I, I'm sure you, you may have developed them more, but they seem to me half-baked. People mention them because they want to do something. The worst reason to do something is to do something. It's almost always the, the rule of thumb. If you just want to do something because you're frustrated, okay, people have written about um, humanitarian safe havens. That means troops on the ground. Otherwise, you can't protect them. And we even saw when you do have troops on the ground what happened in Srebrenica. But without troops on the ground, it's a farce. So you need troops on the ground. Same for humanitarian corridor. A no-fly zone means weeks and weeks, according to the US military, at least a month of sustained attacks on uh, Syria's air defenses, which are far greater than anything Libya had. And the air defenses are intermingled in civilian areas. So you'll have collateral, what they, you, people euphemistically call collateral damage. And then what? I mean, I'm not sure what any of these steps, short of an invasion or, or a step that's really meant to overthrow the regime, what does it do? It, it, it doesn't stop the war and may, in fact, in some level, intensify it. You would have an opposition that's going to become more militarized, could possibly, and one would say perhaps probably more militant and perhaps more Islamist in its makeup, a regime that's going to fight to the end to survive. I don't see how that's good news for, and more and more regional countries jumping in. I mean, Syria has traditionally been a, perhaps the, 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 the worst export of instability in the region. It could well become the worst or the best importer of instability because you'll have countries, not just bordering countries, but from afar, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, that's going to invest in what has now become a proxy war between all kinds of entities, and it will become even more so if we intervene. So, I want to hear a, a cogent plan, and then we could assess the risks. And by the way, I think the administration has considered them, and that's precisely why President Obama at this point has said he hasn't heard of any that makes sense to him. But Rob, I don't want to let you out, out of the hot seat so yeah. easily, because it sounds like you're describing a disaster if we do nothing and a disaster if we do something. So play policymaker for something. What do you do when faced with those choices? Well, like Shadi, I think that the, the emphasis now should be on trying to, to get the, the Kofi Annan mission to work. And to do that, it's not simply Kofi Annan being out there. The key for him is to try to get the Russians to put pressure on their allies in Syria. I mean, I would see, actually, I think the US could play that role of talking to the Russians and saying, the way this is heading now is not going to be good to either, for either one of us. It's certainly going to be good for us because we're going to be pressured to intervene. And I suspect that at some point, if nothing changes, the US will intervene. Mm -hmm. I, I may not be, I'm not in favor of it, but I think the pressures will grow. Um, the, the civil war will continue. That's not what we want. And the Russians are going to get exactly what they say they don't want, which is chaos, instability, the rise of Islamism, of jihadi Islam in the region. So you could have that conversation and say, we need to come up with a political plan that won't give either side everything they want. Bashar ultimately will have to go. It won't be a precondition, but there'll be a transition. And at the end, there'll be elections. And one expects that he, will, he won't prevail. But the opposition is not going to get the complete overhaul of the regime. It's going to be much more gradual, perhaps looking more like Yemen than uh, other countries, than Iraq, certainly. Perhaps there's that play that needs to be made, but it means believing in it, investing in it, not a week or two. I think if you're waiting a week or two, then I could guarantee that it's not going to work. The Russians need to be brought on board. It's going to take some time, and the Americans have to be prepared. Well, the allies of the region, regime have to be prepared to put pressure on the regime, and the allies of the opposition have to be prepared. If I just jump in, I mean, what, I, what I've argued is that 
the threat of military intervention and diplomacy have to go hand in hand. I think choosing one or the other, that's a false choice. I just don't see why Assad would alter his calculations. He believes that he's going to win right now. The only thing in my view that will alter that calculation is a credible threat of military force. So I think actually that military intervention or the prospect of it would actually breathe new life into diplomatic efforts. Let's recall Libya. It was only after the NATO operation started that Gaddafi's regime began talking about offering concessions to the opposition. And there was a lot of back and forth. It's not, a lot, it's not as if diplomacy stopped once military intervention started. So I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. Let's, let's, just, just very quick, because, uh, because I want to hear what the, again, I'm open to, although I'm, my, my, my instincts tell me that's a bad idea, but I still haven't heard what military intervention, what do you do about their air defenses, what do you do about their chemical weapons, what do you do about the risk of sectarian war intensifying, what do you do about the risk of outsiders coming in? Yeah, Rob, we we what, might want to do something, but we have to think these What through. I'm worried about is now we have this new standard of military intervention that if it's slightly more difficult than Libya, we shouldn't do it. No. But nothing is, nothing is going to be as easy as Libya ever again. And, okay, so, I mean, there's a variety. That's like saying anything that's, that's, that's uh, easier than Iraq, we should do. I mean, I'm not, that's not my standard. It's not harder than Libya. I yeah, just when want people something say, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So, um, I think one, one possibility, and the one that's been discussed the most, is establishing safe zones. So you would designate, similar to, um, similar to in some ways Bosnia, where you would have internationally designated safe zones. And you would need close air support to essentially protect them. Yes, there would have to be an effort to take out Syrian air defenses. But what, what I and Anne-Marie Slaughter and others have argued is that once the opposition is able to carve out certain territories and have those territories protected, then they can establish temporary ceasefire arrangements with the Syrian regime. Again, diplomacy will go hand in hand. And the credible threat of military force and eventually actual military force would force the regime to come into negotiations with rebel forces that actually have territory. And the effort here, I think, is to create a kind of Syrian Benghazi, which is possible. Okay, yeah. I'm going okay. to okay. stop you there because okay. we, I'll have, come back we have a big region to cover. <laughs> the audience can bring us back to Syria. I want to continue on our depressing tour of the region. <laughs> so far, the, the Arab monarchies, as, as we alluded to earlier, have done a remarkably good job of withstanding this populist tidal wave through a combination of bribery, co-optation, some reform in countries like Morocco and Jordan, and outright intimidation and, and, and violence, as we've seen in Saudi, but especially in Bahrain. Uh, will this keep working indefinitely, even in the, the short term? Uh, indefinitely or in the short term? Well, you can answer in, in the alternative, or you can answer both. Sorry, what will keep working exactly? This, this strategy that's worked, that's kept the monarchies quiet for the last year. Yeah, well, I think there is a, a, a distinction between monarchies and republics. If we look at the five countries that have had... Yeah, but this is why I asked specifically about the monarchies, because it, the strategy does seem to be working for them. My question is, will it continue to? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think monarchies have an advantage, because in many of these countries, they do have some degree of popular legitimacy. Um, they may not be liked by everyone, but at least there's something there. It's not as if you have this single one leader that's hated so much that the entire opposition is able to rally around that. And one of the countries I focus on is Jordan. And the opposition there has have been having a lot of trouble because they don't have a clear message. Constitutional monarchy, that's not going to get people out into the streets, because partly because the monarchy claims it's already a constitutional monarchy. So it's hard to mobilize people because you don't have that Mubarak figure. You don't have that Assad figure. So I think it's going to take longer, and that's why in certain monarchies there's a chance for gradual reform. In Morocco and Jordan, at least those regimes have have been somewhat interested in reform. There have been some steps. I don't think they've gone far enough, but at least there's something to work with there. And those are also two close U.S. allies, so there's leverage. But I will, and I, I think I said this in the, in the video, autocracies don't last forever. So even if it seems very unlikely now that these regimes, say Saudi Arabia, for example, will fall, just because we can't imagine it doesn't mean it won't happen. Because I don't know one Middle East analyst on the planet who predicted Tunisia. Actually, it was the opposite. Everyone said, you know, Tunisia is the most stable of the stable. That's what everyone was saying before the Arab Spring started. But it happened. So I think we have to get out of this kind of closed mentality and consider the possibility that Saudi Arabia could very well fall in the next five to ten years. 
Rob, what do you think happens next in the next six months, in the next two years, in the next five years? Where? Throughout the region. Does, <laughs> does this, there, because there seems to be, let's, let's stick with the monarchies for a second. The, 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 the spring seems to have frozen there. Does that, fro that, that freeze maintain or does it thaw again? I, I'm, I'm with Shadi in terms of avoiding uh, uh, forecasts because I would have been wrong before, so I don't want to repeat that now. I do, but I do think, I don't really see a distinction between monarchies and republics sort of generically. I think it's a matter of structurally do the regimes have, do they, do they uh, trigger the kind of opposition? And I could see it happening in any of the monarchies. Mm -hmm. I also am not particularly optimistic about, or I don't really believe this notion of gradual reform. What, what the people want, the first they call for reform. What they really want is regime change. And regimes don't, are not in the habit of committing suicide. So they'll give just enough to preserve the structure of the regime, but they're not going to give so much as to give up what has made their power. So ultimately, I think whether it's Jordan or Saudi Arabia or elsewhere, I think, but I'm not going to give you a, a time horizon. I think that, you know, to quote Hillary Clinton, the days are numbered, which doesn't say much because all our days are numbered. But I do think that the, <laughs> this is not, these, these are not, there's no reason, there's nothing intrinsic in a monarchy. There's something intrinsic in countries that have a lot of money. And that's why Saudi Arabia and some of the Gulf countries will survive, I, in my view, not because they're monarchies, but because they have plenty of money to, 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 to dole out. At some point, the unemployment rate, the, uh, the, what will happen to the oil market and other things in, 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 in Saudi Arabia are going to cause real problems, and people are predicting it over the next 10 to 15 years. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to try to predict it, but I think it, it would be wrong to think that because it's a monarchy, somehow it's immune from what's happened elsewhere in the region. This is a good point for us to open up the floor for questions. So um, if you could, we have microphones coming around. If you could bring up the house lights so I could see. This gentleman on the aisle here, just wait for the mic and... Give us your name and affiliation when you get it, please. Up here near the front. Can you raise your hand again, please? No, keep coming. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Spencer Schwartz from uh, Cornell University. And uh, with regard to military intervention in Syria, um, with reports that there have been US Special Forces units placed in Syria to train the rebels, and Russia, who everyone knows, arms the Assad regime, placing supposed anti-piracy forces, ironically, away from the Gulf of Aden, in Syria. How do you see that complicating uh, the international intervention? Shadi, are we getting the kind of proxy war you were, you were speaking about already? I mean, it's already a proxy war. Yeah. It is. I mean, the, Iran the Iranians and the Russians have been actively supporting the Assad regime much more enthusiastically than we've been supporting the Syrian opposition, so they're already there's, it's not balanced. Um, and the Saudis and the Qataris have talked about arming the rebels, so we're already moving in that direction. Now, what I'm worried about is we take this kind of half-baked measure of saying, we want to feel good, we want to do something, so let's arm the rebels, and we'll just keep it at that, because that sounds, that sounds reasonable, right? It's not full-on military intervention, but I think by itself that's going to be counterproductive because the gap in resources between the rebels and the regime is still tremendous. So that's not going to solve the problem. They need more than arms. But this is one area, one issue on which we agree. I think the worst idea would be to arm the opposition for all the reasons one could imagine. Mm -hmm. We're not sure where their arms will end up. You know, they could end up fighting each other. They might commit massacres with the weapons that we've given them. So I think we, we agree on that. I do want to simply say that, the, the, I mean, because again, I, I, this is an issue that I, that I could see would keep many people awake at night because of what's happening in Syria. But every expert I've spoken to who's dealt with safe havens throughout the world has said it doesn't work. And it won't work in Syria for all the reasons that I tried to describe earlier. It won't change the dynamic. So you'll have, uh, you'll have people who are being, what, going to be armed in one area. It's going to be, have to be protected by ground troops. It's going to have to be protected from the air, which means going to war basically with Syria. It's not, I think that falls in the same category, although less harmful than arming the opposition, but the same category of half-baked answers for people who are legitimately frustrated by the lack of a good alternative and are going to jump to something that I don't think is going to solve the problem and could make it worse. Now, uh, Shadi, how do you feel about a more full-baked uh, option for Syria, a more robust intervention of some kind? Yeah, that's, that's what I support. So uh, not just safe havens, but what? Well, yeah, I mean, when people talk about military intervention, I think sometimes we're not clear on what we mean. Right. So when people talk about humanitarian corridors as something that is short of military intervention, no, that is a form of military intervention. 
I mean, safe zones, buffer zones, all of this requires some kind of military involvement. So be more specific. We're talking about Western air support. We're talking about training <coughs> for the rebels. What exactly do you have in mind? Yeah. So there would have to be arming and training of the rebels as a very basic thing. But for me, that's more just an issue that everyone has a right to defend themselves from slaughter. And we have to give them the arms so they can do that very basic thing. But beyond that, um, I, would, I would like to see the Turks and the Arabs taking the lead. And Turkey is in a position to play that kind of leadership role. They've talked about it internally. There's a, there isn't a robust debate in, in Turkey about whether or not the time has come to establish a safe zone along the border because the refugee problem is getting worse for them every day. But there will have to be Western air support. And this is what we always kind of end up with, that even if everyone else is on board with doing something, if the U.S. isn't, it's not going to happen. That's what we saw in Libya, where everyone else in the world, the Arab League, GCC, Britain, France, was supporting military intervention. The U.S. wasn't, so there was essentially a stalemate. Finally, in the last six days um, before intervention, the U.S. shifted, and that was enough to push it. So I think that is still going to be the reality that um, with all this talk of leading from behind, <laughs> well, still, the U.S. is going to have to play an important leadership role because of its military uh, capacity. Great. Let's take another question. This lady here. Hi. Hajar Naini for Women's News. Uh, I, I want to know... Uh, when the Arab Spring started, we had a uh, high expectation um, for the future of women. Uh, they have played a tremendous role on, on front line. Now, uh, when it comes to giving them um, a political voice, uh, there is a, a dark future. I want to know if it's just a matter of time and change will come, or if it, a, a real concern in the Middle East and North Africa. Can we have faith that the status of women will improve? And again, if not, let's ask the policymaker question. What do we do about it? Um, I think today well, it's hard to have faith. I mean, again, to be a woman or to be a minority in, uh, in, in, in a religious minority is probably not a very good time. Um, well, you know, that may well change because women may take matters in their own hands. They may, they may start protesting themselves. But if you just take a snapshot today and you project, it's, you know, th th it's not as if we're seeing the, the, the trends or the arc of history bending, uh, to use your words, towards greater rights for women or greater rights for, for religious minorities. That, that's not where things are headed. I think many people felt that, saw that at the time. It doesn't mean that one should have been against the uprising, but to have a very realistic view that it was not going to be everything that some of the most enthusiastic Pollyannish Western commentators who thought that they saw their own reflection in what was happening in the Arab world. So, um let me see how I should phrase this. I, got in, I was speaking at an event yesterday, and I got into this topic. I got into some trouble. So let me just try to be try very... Try and replicate that. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Let me just try to be clear. Um, look, there's a tension between democracy and liberalism. The more democracy in the Arab world, um, that's not going to translate into the things that we as Americans hold dear. It's not going to mean gender equality. It's not going to mean the rise of liberalism. If anything, the opposite. I think what we may be seeing is the rise of illiberal democracy. And you know what? I don't particularly have a problem with that because I'm a small d Democrat. I don't think that, you know, my, myself as an American, I have the right to come in and tell Arabs they have to be liberal or to share our own notions of gender equality. My bottom line is that Arabs have to make their own decisions. If they want to, if 75% of Egyptians want to vote for either the Muslim Brotherhood or ultra conservative Salafis, that is their choice, and we have to respect that. And part of the mistake of the last five decades is we weren't willing to let Arabs make their own choices. And I think we have to come to terms, as Rob is saying, that there isn't a real constituency in a place like Egypt for gender equality. Yes, there may be a constituency for women's empowerment, but these are two different things. And for example, and the examples are so many, there was a YouGov poll last March where only 18% of Egyptians said they supported the idea of a female president. And the list goes on beyond women's rights. There was a December 2010 Pew poll where 82% of Egyptians believed that adulterers should, adulterer should be stoned. 77% said they supported the hands of thieves being cut off. 
Okay, but Shadi, why should the U.S. use the leverage that you've described and in, in it having and criticized it for not using more to push for democracy for some Egyptians, say, but not all Egyptians? Uh, so what do, you mean, what do you mean? Well, if the Egyptians choose to disenfranchise, you use their new democratic powers to disenfranchise some Egyptians, to, um, to oppress women, to reduce the rights of minorities, why should the United States not use its influence to... to right. I think, there, I think what we can all agree on is that there has to be basic non-negotiable principles, preferably in the Constitution itself. So equality before the law is fundamental to whatever kind of democracy we're talking about. Um, and that's actually something that the Muslim Brotherhood and even some Salafis say they agree with. Now, so that's why I think that there is a general consensus that women have the right to vote in a place like Egypt. I don't think that's going to be rolled back. But when we get into family law, personal status law, divorce proceedings, um, things of that nature that have traditionally been the realm of family law, and so each community, so the Christian community in Egypt has traditionally overseen its own religious affairs and the Muslim community its own religious affairs. Um, yeah, I want to interject. I mean, I, you know, I don't have any, I think they should have the right to govern themselves the way they want to govern themselves. I've been, I've been saying for years, well before the Arab Spring, that we shouldn't have the hostile attitude we had towards the Muslim Brotherhood. But I think it's a different matter to answer your question. I mean, your, I forget who asked the question about what the U.S. should do. It doesn't mean that we should support democratic uh, and, and support regimes that are moving in a way that, that are antithetical to our values when it comes to women or religious minorities. It doesn't mean that we try to, that we try to undermine them or we try to overthrow them. But I think it, it's, it's sort of odd if our position is that we are uh, taking a moral stand in favor of democracy and some of these countries then take, take, implement policies that are truly at odds with what we say we believe in, that that wouldn't affect uh, how, we, how we act. So I'm not, I'm not sure how you reconcile a support for the idea of democracy, but turning a blind eye to some things that we may yeah. Uh, object Yeah, I'm not saying we turn a blind eye to it, but I think we have to just realize that there's sometimes going to be a trade-off. And I think, you know, if we have to choose between liberalism and democracy, I would prefer that we err on the side of the latter. That's all I'm saying. Yes, to the extent possible, we should push for women's rights, but um, we just have to go into it knowing that it's going to be very difficult. And ultimately, these cultural changes are going to have to come from within. We can't just impose a quota uh, in, a, in, in elections and say, you know, 30% have to be represented and think that's going to solve the problem. It's much more deep-seated than that, and it's going to take a long time. So I'm just saying that we have to no, take that, that. longer-term approach. Okay, let's I, take another question, we could impose. Please. You here. My name is Fred Schlissel, Independent Management Consultants. Um, uh, I just want to comment first that it took our own country 10 or 20 years to establish our own democracy, considering the Articles of Confederation and so on. Uh, there's been some discussion uh, of an undefined U.S. role in these Arab countries. I'd like you to comment on whether a U.S. role is possible, considering the potential conflict and chaos that, may, that is likely to result from the deeply seated sectarian and tribal societies in these countries. The US has no experience and no knowledge and no understanding of these kinds of societies. How can we possibly play a role? A well, and I, I, I think I said earlier, I would be very modest about the role we can play for that reason and for the reason that it, historically when we've tried to play in the domestic politics of any of the countries in the region, at best we've gotten it wrong. In most cases it's come back to haunt us because we just don't know how to handle it for all the reasons you give. So I'm, I'm on the side of modesty when it comes to what the U.S. can do in terms of really playing with the internal politics. Again, we should avoid certain things. We don't have to give military assistance to countries if we don't approve of what they're doing, but to try to micromanage or to get into the kitchen. Um, again, I think we've tried, we tried to do it in Lebanon, we tried to do it in Palestine, we're doing it now in Iraq, we're trying to do it in Afghanistan. I don't think that our track record is particularly uh, positive. Let's take another question, please. The woman in the back. You, yep. I'm Meredith Morrison with the Clinton Foundation. Um, back to Syria. To what extent do we understand the values of the opposition that we would be supporting if we went in, other than not Assad? Um, that is, you know, how do we know it's not going to turn into, say, the Iraq that Ned Parker described in the last Foreign Affairs, um, which is a way for the formerly disenfranchised to exact revenge, not 
protect women and minorities. Let me take it. I, listen, I, I don't know that we do know, um, it's, which is not necessarily a reason <coughs> not to be sympathetic to the opposition, but you raise a good point. I, I don't think that it's very clear who the opposition is. I think the ones that we tend to deal with, the, the, the Syrian National Council, if you speak to other members of the opposition, they don't recognize them at all as their representatives. If you speak to Syrians within Syria, and we have, uh, my organ the International Crisis Group has people, somebody in Syria working, you speak to them inside, they have very mixed views. I think, you know, just a cut to, to take a broader picture, what was really the, the, the strength of the, of the Syrian uprising at the beginning was the three, their three slogans, which is no to violence, no to sectarianism, no to militarization and outside intervention. Unfortunately, and, and the regime wanted to destroy all three of those, right? It wanted it to be sectarian, it wanted there to be militarization, and it didn't mind foreign intervention because it allowed them to project the uprising as an Islamist, foreign-backed uh, sectarian uprising. Unfortunately, that's where they seem to have been winning and to be dragging the opposition more on a, on a plane where it's gonna have a much harder time prevailing because in a military contest, as Shadi said, the Syrians are much stronger, the Syrian uh, regime is much stronger than the opposition and it's gonna take a very long time to the opposition to play catch up. And on the sectarian game, the, the regime also has a lot of allies among minorities if it says, this is who you want us to be replaced with. That's still a minority of the opposition, but the more this, this drags on and the more they fall into that, sort of the trap laid by the regime, which is to make it more sectarian, to make it more violent, uh, and, and to, to sort of call for outside intervention, I think that's gonna be a real problem for the opposition, which again is one of the reasons why I'm, I, I would be extremely reluctant, not reluctant, hostile to arming the opposition. Shadi, do you have a different view? Yeah. And, and specifically, do you have faith that we can rely on the opposition not to start a sectarian bloodbath? Right. Well, first of all, we do know about parts of the opposition. The Syrian National Council is a, is a fairly representative body, and it's been recognized as a legitimate representative of the Syrian people by a number of countries. But in any case, you don't deal with the opposition you want. You deal with the opposition you have. There's never going to be a perfect opposition, and why would there be? Um, because, first of all, they live in a variety of different countries because the Assad regime hasn't allowed and, and a public opposition to emerge because of the repressive situation. Um, so yes, if um, in a new Syria, the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood could very well be the dominant party. Islamists do represent a major portion of the Syrian opposition. That's certainly true. Again, that shouldn't be surprising to anyone. Anywhere where there are democratic openings or free elections, Islamists will almost always be the dominant party. That's just the reality, and I don't see why that should prevent us from acting. But let me return to the speaker's question, because the Iraq um, parallel is, is a, an important one. How do we ensure that a formerly disenfranchised, in this case majority, as was the case in Iraq, doesn't use its newfound power to oppress its former oppressors? Well, various opposition, opposition groups have issued those kinds of guarantees, whether it's the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood or the Syrian National Council. They've tried to reassure minorities that if they do come to power, there won't be those kinds of reprisals. Obviously, there's no guarantees, which is why we also have to be honest. We couldn't just militarily intervene and then leave. We would have to be very active in the rebuilding of Syria thereafter and to play an influencing role with the opposition. And that's why we have to develop relationships with the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, with other groups that are part of the Syrian National Council. So if and when they do come to power, they will listen to us and we can have some leverage. Please. I mean, first, I, if I were a minority in Syria, I'm not sure that I would take those guarantees very seriously, as you say, and I, 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 I'm not sure I would trust them, particularly if I look at what's happening in the rest of the region. The second point you make, which is, which may be theoretically correct, which is we'd have to be there after the, uh, the fall of the regime, which I read as code word for having a presence on the ground. Again, we want, we want to entangle ourselves after trying to extricate ourselves from Iraq and Afghanistan, now plunging into Syria in a country that is going to be, however successfully the toppling of the regime occurs, when and if it occurs, it's going to be a very difficult situation with groups that are going to, armed groups that are going to oppose the new order. I think you raised the Iraq analogy. I mean, three things, and the analogy is obviously very, uh, very inaccurate in many ways, but three things that are, Iraqis will tell you that they learned from their experience, or that we could say that they ought to have learned from their experience in the rest of the world. Uh, the danger of relying on outside military intervention, 
the danger of relying or on the West investing and the world investing in one group and saying they're the opposition, they represent the opposition. I'm not sure the SNC is probably more representative than Shalabi was, but nonetheless, I'm not sure how representative it is in, in, uh, in, in Syria. And the third is the threat of sort of undoing everything in the old regime in the hopes of creating a new one. We saw what it meant to disband the Ba'ath Party. We saw what it meant to disband the army. So I think without trying to project too much from Iraq, let's at least keep those three lessons in mind. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, in the back on the left. My name is Mehmet Kılıç from the Turkish Cultural Center in New York. Uh, when we talk about um, the Turkish democracy as a model for the Arab nations, um, you know... It, it, but please make it a question. Uh, sure. Thank you. But I have to say this uh, before the before the question. Uh, the the Prime Minister of Turkey, when he had his first visit to the uh, you know Arab nations, he talked about the democracy and also the secularism in Turkey. But the people didn't really welcome the secularism part. To how do you think the Arab nations will accept secularism, the uh, separation of church and state, as they welcome democracy? Is there a well? The, the basic option? answer is they won't. Mm -hmm. They won't. I mean, I don't. I think I've, I can't even think of any Egyptian activist I know who publicly calls himself a secularist. There's a couple on Twitter, I guess, but actually ones that have influence, um, they don't call them that. The word in Arabic, Almani, is a bad word in Arabic. No one wants to be called that. And even the word liberal, there are actually liberal parties in Egypt that when they're campaigning, they don't call themselves liberal because liberal is a bad word in a lot it's of the Egypt. Same here. Country too, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so if anyone, if anyone is hoping for the separation of mosque, uh, well, there's different definitions of secularism, but if people are looking for what we consider to be secularism, they're not going to find it in most of the Arab world. Let's take another question, please. You here in the third row? Uh, hi, my name is Graham Starr from Tufts University. Uh, you talk a lot how the U.S. needs to at least put some intervention in, but uh, you also contradict that by saying military intervention is probably the worst thing that can be done. Uh, to, to Rob. But um, does that mean that the only, I guess, uh, position that the U.S. can take is sort of empowering civil society inside the countries to take their own action? And if so, how do we do that in places like uh, where we're able to in, in Libya or in Egypt, or how do we do that in Syria? What are the good non-military options, if there are any? For what? For Syria or for... For, sure. for um, I guess, uh, it's a, I guess we can make it a two-part question. How do you develop civil society in Libya and Egypt, or how do you use non-military intervention in Syria? I, mean, I think I tried to answer the question earlier. I don't think we're going to develop civil society anywhere. Right. I mean, or we develop it. civil society here. I don't know, we're yeah. a different country, but it would be a bit odd if you had a debate now in, in Egypt and Tunisia. What could we do to empower the... Democrats who seem too weak, or the Republicans, or some other civil society. These are, it's their stories. Now, we have done things in the past, as Shadi said, that have not just not helped them, but have hurt them. And we still may be doing some of those things. But I think, it, do no harm, but the notion that we're going to go in and develop those who are allies, the fact is, at this point still, our kiss is, is maybe not the kiss of death, but it certainly is a kiss of suffering, because we have the NGOs and others who are tainted even very, I mean, and, and, and consider the irony most of the parties in Egypt, I think almost all of them, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafis, and others, have all benefited from these programs from the American-funded NGOs. And yet, as soon as this became an issue of American funding, they all ran for cover and said, we don't want to have anything to do with it. We shouldn't, uh, what are these people doing intervening in our country? I think those are the kinds of things we should stay away from. I mean, if people want our assistance, uh, we could find ways to, to provide it. But let's not view ourselves as the midwives of either civil society or democracy in a part of the world where we've been associated with the precise opposite for the past. But Rob, decade. the problem is that in many of these countries there aren't indigenous sources of funding for, because for one, there's very restrictive NGO laws. So it doesn't have to be coming from the US, but the international community has to support civil society because many of these groups don't have another option. Um, many of the NGOs I've dealt with in Egypt get almost all of their funding from Western sources. And there, some of them are doing very important work. And I just don't think we should betray them and leave them alone, especially when they don't have to. If people don't want to take our money, they don't have to. But if they're coming to us and requesting 
that assistance, I, I think we should engage with them. Let's stop there. We're almost out of time. I want to take two more quick questions. I'll take them together and then I'll leave it to our speakers to finish. So first question is here in the third row. The second is the gentleman uh, on the uh, right aisle about halfway back. Wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> I'm Dan Harris. I'm an attorney. I, I find this a very interesting conversation. I'd like to ask you uh, directly, given our wonderful nation-building experience in Afghanistan and in Iraq and you name the rest, how it is that you would advocate our intervening and attempting to do something in Syria that would have a better outcome? Uh, let's, let's keep it there because we okay. we, we're almost out of time. The question at the back, please. Yes, Christian Russell. I represent the financial sector. I was wondering if you could briefly comment on how... <laughs> <laughs> then this is I the won't ask a financial, I won't ask an economic <laughs> related question. <laughs> I was wondering if you could just briefly comment on how this, uh, or the, the uprising has affected Iranians' uh, presence on the Arab Street, if you could. Okay. Uh, Shadi, how do we avoid Afghanistan in Syria? Um, and then if the two of you can reassure the financial sector um, <laughs> about the, the, the mood of the Iranian street. Yeah. Okay. On, um, I don't think the analogy with Iraq is good because Iraq was not a humanitarian intervention. Um, and it was a mistake. And I mean, I was against the war. I think Rob was <laughs> probably against, right? So, I mean, we're, we're in agreement, we're in agreement right. about that. It, it was, and it's, I think it's unfortunate that in some ways the Syrians are paying the price for our, for our mistakes in Iraq. Because I, I think if Iraq didn't happen, people would be much more willing to consider um, mili uh, hu humanitarian intervention as an organizing principle. And it is, it's supposed to be. It's called the responsibility to protect, which is, which is a UN endorsed norm. So I, I just, I'm very hesitant about this Iraq comparison because we went in for the wrong reasons. We didn't have the right intentions. We didn't have a plan. And I think the better comparisons are with Kosovo and Bosnia. And yes, they were far from perfect, but at least I think we can say, looking back, that they worked out better and relatively good on balance. So, um, but that said, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I take military intervention lightly. It's going to be very difficult, very risky. It could go very, very wrong. But I just happen to believe that it's the least bad of a set of very bad options. That's what we're dealing with. As for Iran, um, the, the good thing about the Arab Spring um, if, you're, if you really care about the Iran issue, is that Iran has never been more isolated than it is now. And um, they're very clearly on the wrong side of this. They're backing the repression in Syria. And um, I don't think they've been on the right side of history in this respect. And people realize that. And, you know, I've been meeting with um, Islamist leaders pretty regularly since 2005. I've never heard one of them talk about Iran as a model. No one now, and it, no one now, is talking about Iran as a model. So I just think we should keep that in mind and we shouldn't overestimate Iran's soft power in the region. It has very little of it. And it started in 2009 when they crushed their own people. Everyone saw that. And they lost any moral legitimacy they might have had left in the eyes of Arabs. Rob, jump in if you have anything to add, and specifically if you have anything to add about the, how this is all playing out inside Iran. Okay, well, quickly on both questions. I mean, on, I think there's a reason why people in the, in the region and elsewhere are looking to Iraq and Afghanistan with all the differences that you make. It's because there are lessons to be learned. Every case is different, but every case carries a lesson for the next one. And I think if we think we could do more successfully in Syria than what we did in Iraq, we're gonna, we should think about it long and hard. Um, when it comes to Iran, I mean, I don't disagree that the, the Arab Spring has not been very kind to Iran. I think, ironically, two of those that have lost as a result of the Arab Spring are Iran and the U.S. The U.S. because it lost Mubarak, Iran because it may be losing Syria, and because it now has another model to compete with, which is not sort of the model of autocratic pro-American regimes. There's also these other sort of uh, uh, more unknown entities. What it, where does Egypt stand? Where does Tunisia stand? Where does Libya stand? I think that's made it more complicated. But I would say, I think one of, the, one of the mistakes we would be making, and I hear it every now and then, particularly in the case of Syria, is to try to superimpose a strategic regional agenda 
on the Arab Spring. And when I speak of a proxy war and the notion that we're going, we're get, we should go after Syria, and I'm not saying you say this, but many others mm. do, particularly the neocons in the city I come from, uh, we should go after Syria, yes, because of the humanitarian thing, but mainly because it's going to strike a blow uh, against Iran. The more we're going to look at the region through the prism of a fight between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and the US, Iran and Israel, the worse it's going to be, not just for the region, but I think for us, because it's not a fight that we're, that we're in a position to win. And I think that if it leads us down the road of confrontation with Iran, it's a fight that everyone's going to lose from. It's past 8 o'clock. I was hoping to hold out for a note of optimism, but uh, it looks like it's <laughs> eluded us. I thought we were so close on Iran, and it slipped away. <laughs> so you've all been sitting very patiently for an hour and a half. Please join me in thanking our two guest speakers, and thank you all for coming.